Okay, right. hey, well, thanks very much, uh, Tim. Uh, welcome, everybody. Welcome back uh, to the University of Toronto. It's a pleasure to have you here. Also, for the uh, hundreds of students that are watching this uh, conference by video link in classrooms around the building, uh, welcome to you and welcome to the Robert School. And, and of course, this is our fourth annual conference of machine learning and the market for intelligence. Uh, and every year, as many of you know, uh, we have a theme for the conference. Last year, for example, our theme was time. How long will it take to develop various aspects of machine intelligence? Uh, this year, our theme uh, is compliments. And so I'll begin by addressing three questions uh, with respect to compliments. Uh, the first is, what are they anyways? Uh, the second is, why are they important? And third, given that our conference has always been focused on markets for intelligence, it begs the question, how will markets for compliments be different than markets for the intelligence itself? Okay, so that's the backdrop. Uh, and my job is, uh, right now is just to set the stage for all the presentations that you're about to see. <clears throat> okay, so what are AI compliments and why are they important? Let me wind back the tape uh, 30, 30 years to an observation made by a Nobel laureate and an MIT professor, Robert Solo, uh, who made the observation that there are these productivity enhancing tools, personal computers, that were proliferating everywhere uh, in businesses, in homes, and you really couldn't look anywhere without seeing more and more computers, and yet they weren't showing up in the productivity statistics. Uh, so he makes this observation, you can see the computer age everywhere, except in the productivity statistics. And just to remind everybody, uh, you know, uh, that productivity sometimes sounds complex, but it's very simple. The basic idea is it's the ratio of inputs to outputs. So for example, for 100 hours of human labor, uh, we have X amount of output. If we can do something so that we get 20% more output with the same amount of labor, we've increased productivity by 20%. So, 13 years after Robert Solo makes this observation, another economist, uh, Paul David, professor at Stanford, responds to this. He publishes this article in the American Economic Review, uh, and effectively he says, by turning to economic history, we can s I think I found where the productivity has gone missing. And the answer is, it's in the future. It's coming, it just hasn't arrived yet. And so, to make his case, he builds on an example, a case history that he studies that's often compared to AI today, which is electrification. And so he looks at distributed electricity, and he says, at the turn of the century, so this is in the uh, early 1900s, far-sighted engineers already had envisaged profound transformations that electrification would bring to factories, stores, and homes. Now, many of you will well, Phil, this sentence feels really familiar because we're reading it all over again today with respect to AI. The same sentence. Just switch, switch out electrification and drop in AI. And so his observation here is that, uh, that people were already imagining what a transformative effect electrification would have. And just as an aside, many people have taken the view that AI will in fact be implemented in a similar way to electricity. The same way that electricity permeated everything in a way that uh, economists call, described as a GPT, a general purpose technology, because it affects every industry. So will AI. And the same way that electricity uh, is delivered and distributed, that perhaps that will also be the way that uh, electricity brought all the, this type of equipment and these things to life, so will AI will make all these things in uh, But then uh, Paul David makes the observation, says, but the materialization of such visions was hardly imminent. In 1899, the United States electrical lighting was being used in a mere 3% of all residences. It would take another two decades, roughly speaking, for these aggregate measures of the extent of electrification to attain the 50% diffusion level. So effectively, he's setting up the key question, which is, what took so long? Why did this take so long? So then he goes on to offer his explanation. And he's and his, the, the punchline is about problems. So effectively, he says, look, if you were an entrepreneur pitching distributed electricity, your value prop would have been it saves on fuel costs. And maybe it also saves 
on reduced friction costs because the, the old power systems required uh, mechanical devices to transmit power from one uh, location to another that uh, incurred a fair amount of friction costs that distributed electricity would save. And yes, indeed, distributed electricity did save those costs. But those savings weren't so huge that if you had a perfectly good operating factory, that you would tear down your existing factory to replace it with one just in order to save the uh, fuel costs with distributed electricity. But when you would use it is if you were about to build a new factory. Then you would say, okay, uh, I'm building a new factory. How much can I, how much more efficient, more productive can my factory be if I use this new distributed electricity? And as they would do that, over time they learned a number of things. For example, they learned that the heavy infrastructure, like the bracing on the ceilings required to hold the transmission equipment to be able to just move the power from the source to the, to the machinery, that heavy bracing was no longer needed with distributed electricity. So you can make factories lighter. That made them cheaper. Furthermore, in the old power systems, where you wanted all the machinery as close as possible to the, to the fuel or the, or the water or steam powered uh, uh, power source, that you would stack the machinery on one side of the building so it would be close to the power source. That led to multi-story buildings. With the advent of distributed electricity, we didn't need the multi-story buildings. We didn't need to stack the machinery. We could lay it out all in a single story. So that changed the design. Single-story buildings and multi-story buildings, cheaper to build. Now that's just cap X. Those are the fixed costs. What about the operating costs? After a while, they figured, wait a minute. Once we have this in a single story building, we can change the layout. We can change the workflow. We can have much more efficient handling of materials and assembly. All of that stuff, so the workflow can be far more efficient in this new linear single story uh, layout than in the multi story layout. Big boost in productivity. Then they discovered well, wait a minute. In addition to that, because we don't have all the machines operating off a single group drive, such that when the group drive goes down or one machine goes down, we have to shut down the whole production process. Instead, with the distributed uh, electricity solution, the, the whole thing can be designed in a much more modular fashion so that when one machine goes down, the rest of the factory can keep operating. Big productivity boost. Now, the point here is that all these big productivity boosts didn't come directly from the electricity itself. That was just the fuel savings costs. All of the other savings came from the complements, the, the new design of equipment, the new design of layout, the new organizational design, the workflow design, all of that, those are the complements. Those are the things that really gave electricity its big push, its big productivity boost. On to AI. So that was written in 1990. This year, a paper was uh, published by uh, Eric Renolson and Daniel Rock at MIT and Chad Syverson at Chicago. And they go right back to, to Robert Solow, and they re-ask the same question. But instead of asking it with respect to personal computers, they ask the same question with respect to AI. What do they say? We live in an age of paradox, going right back to Robert Solow's productivity paradox. We live in an age of paradox. Systems using artificial intelligence match or surpass human level performance in more and more domains leveraging rapid advances in other technologies and driving soaring stock prices. Yet, measured productivity growth has declined by half over the past decade, and real income has stagnated since the late 1990s for a majority of Americans. Why? Why the paradox? Why on one hand AI is doing all these incredible things, and on the other hand we don't see any productivity statistics? And so they say, we're going to investigate four possible explanations. Explanation one, what they call false hopes. False hopes is, you know, there's a lot of chit chat about AI. Maybe it's puffering. Maybe it's not really as compelling as what everybody thinks. Explanation two is they say, uh, maybe in fact, it's mismeasurement. Maybe the productivity gains are really there. We're just not measuring them properly. Explanation three, maybe it's a redistribution problem. Maybe what's happening is that there's just a few large companies that are de uh, deploying commercial grade AI for things like advertising, and they're not really increasing productivity, they're just shifting wealth around. So they're stealing business from one company to another, and so really AI is just being used for, for clever targeted advertising in a way that uh, concentrates wealth but doesn't increase productivity. 
And then there's explanation number four. Maybe it's implementation lags. Maybe, just like in the prior cases, connectivity is coming. It's just not here yet. It's in the future. It's due to implementation lags. Why is it due to implementation lags? We've already seen demonstrated applications of AI. Why are we still waiting for the big productivity boost? Because it's not just the software. The implementation lags are a result of the compliments. It's the compliments that's the center of their explanation. What are AI compliments? Uh, everything that you would anticipate. So the rest of the software stack and the hardware stack, all the things that the, the hardware that the AI is in, in, embedded in, that it's still racing to catch up with the advances in the prediction technology. And not just the hardware and software, the processes. Now think about how we use AIs today. Today we have pretty much our existing process. Let's say we're processing uh, um, bank loans. We have exactly the same workflow. We just drop in an AI predictions predicting whether the customer will pay back their loan, replace that with the, the, uh, the human prediction. Or think of radiology. We have exactly the same workflow for radiologists. We just drop in the AI classifier that classifies whether the medical image, the pixels on the image, are showing a tumor that is malignant or benign. We replace the human that does that with the AI. But the workflow we've left the same. Or uh, in the case of, uh, of driving, that even with the beautiful Tesla, that we have pretty much still a car that was designed for people, the people in it, and there's just an AI that predicts what a human driver would do, but the car design is the same, the driveways are the same, the roads are the same, the parking lots are the same, the city design is the same. We haven't yet even begun to take advantage of what is possible with the car that can predict how a human can drive and ultimately drive itself. We haven't yet invested in the compliments. And when the compliments come, that's when the big productivity lift happens. So that's their story. Okay, so if you take these, these papers at their face value, uh, not only you know, are the AI and the compliments everywhere, their compliments are data and hardware and software and infrastructure and workflow design, organizational design, regulation, those are the compliments. But also they're super important. In fact, according to these papers, they're everything. They're really, the majority of the productivity lift is not from the actual code, it's from the compliments. Now, if that's the case, then what is, the, what is competition in the compliments going to look like? First of all, what, is compliment, what does competition for AI look like? Well, we know that. In fact, what's interesting about AI is that it's a field that has almost been developed around competition. All of science at some level is motivated by competition, as everybody here knows. Science is a system designed around competition where there's a very big prize for priority. In other words, if you're the first to discover something, you get a big prize. You get a paper or a patent. If you're second, you get almost nothing. So it, it's a setup for competition. But machine learning, more than almost any other field, is just um, driven and, and shaped by competition because it's so focused on benchmarks. So I think the probably the competition that brought deep learning into popular um, recognition was ImageNet. And this was the first time where all these different groups were competing in terms of their ability to recognize images, that the power of deep learning was recognized broadly. This is a picture of a uh, conference room at NIPS, you know, one of the you know, most, you know, the most, uh, one of the largest conferences in Chile. And what is NIPS? NIPS is effectively like a Middle Eastern bazaar for machine learning ideas. Right, so everybody shows up, they report their ideas, and what are they reporting on? They're reporting on their competitive performance against benchmarks, many of the papers. So they have a benchmark, and if they perform well against the benchmark, then they write a paper and say, here's what we did, and here's how it works, and this is why it performs so well against this benchmark. That's how competition in the market for intelligence works. And the culture of this competition aligns with the norms of science. Even the leaders of the, of the machine learning community, you know, the, the George, Paul, John, and Ringo of machine learning themselves have a very benign um, style. In other words, they advocate for norms of science. Even though each one of them is affiliated with a corporation, they are all still tied to universities, and they all still promote publishing results and sharing ideas. So in some sense, the competition for the market for intelligence is very genteel. It 
follows the norms of science and university culture. However, the market for compliments follows no such rules. The market for compliments uh, is a traditional competition over scarce resources. When we're talking about the market for compliments, we're not in Kansas anymore. This is rough and tumble. The prize is huge. We know the prize is very big for winning a commercial grade AI. And as a result of that, it attracts uh, very powerful companies. And that's the backdrop for today. The backdrop for today, the theme for today, every year up till this year, we can focus on specific elements of the AI itself, not this year. This year, the backdrop is the compliments. So if the gold rush is around AI algorithms, the compliments are the shovels. The compliments are all the other things that enable that to work, that generate the real productivity work. So when you see the presentations, some of them are directly about AI, some of them are you know, about algorithms and so on, but they were all chosen for a reason. They, each, each of these will either directly address the issue of compliments or indirectly. You'll, you'll see it in the reflection of the presentation. And so what we ask today is as you're watching these, to have in the back of your mind, every time you see an AI, what are the compliments? And what does competition in that market look like? Because that's where we think the action's going to be.